Okay, so on second thought, I decided I would give you the proof and say a word or two about manifolds, since I said I would. So here's the deal. On, an on a simply connected surface, if you have alpha and beta are two curved segments, both from P to Q, and you have a closed form, one form, so d phi is zero. If you look at this alpha and beta, they form a loop. Um, so alpha minus beta, because you had to go the opposite direction, right? Alpha minus beta is a loop. But we know that because we have a simply connected surface, the integral around the loop is zero. Um, and as we, we that was lemma 7.8, which was back on page five of my notes. Anyway, then standard uh, integration stuff. So alpha minus beta is alpha plus the minus beta curve, but then the orientation reversing um, bit pulls the minus out of the, you know, reverse the curve's direction, you pull the minus out, and there you have it. Integral over alpha is equal to the integral over beta of the form phi. So we have path independence. Now that lays just what we need to complete the proof. The rest of the proof um, is basically based on that. Um, little observation we just made about path independence because that allows us to basically define that potential form in terms of the integral over the form itself. In particular we define f of p as being the integral um, over delta of phi. Now what is delta? I should say first, before I do that really, I should say pick a point p naught in m, alright, and then let delta be a, uh, you know, curved segment um, from P naught uh, to P. And so we define F of P by that. And the function is well defined because it doesn't matter which path you go from P naught to P, right? I could call this thing delta, but I could just as well call this delta. It doesn't matter. Either is going to give me the same result. All right. So we wish to show that um, phi is equal to df. That's actually what we believe to be true. And so to show that, I need to show basically that phi of v is equal to df of v. Um, for each uh, vector v. And so, as usual, we'll get our pause on that data using a curve, at least at this point in the course, that's what we're doing. Before, it seemed like we were using coordinates, whatever. Anyway, as I've warned you, um, sometimes the curve way of thinking about vectors is, is more useful. Here's a place for that. So, if we want to consider um, alpha, a curve segment, so a to b to m with alpha prime of a equals to v, and then the path, let's say the path, uh, let me give this path a name, let's call it beta. Beta is formed by traveling delta then alpha restricted to the sub interval a to t. All right. So again, that's running one curve and and then another, right? So then, if we calculate f of alpha of t, that's the integral over. Um, Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Uh, well, beta really, because beta goes to um, beta ends. This ends at where alpha of t. Okay, so it goes from this starts at p dot. So using path independence again, um, it's we can just put beta there, right? But the integral over beta is actually the integral over delta using additivity of the integral plus the integral of alpha restricted to at uh, phi, that, that path. 
of course by definition the first one is f of p all right I'm still talking about that specific path uh, delta and then the second piece by the definition actually um, of the integral over a one form is the integral from a to t of phi of alpha prime of uh, well we could say u we could say t bar I guess I'll use um, I guess I'll use u is better uh, alpha prime of u du all right however you can see then that um, f prime of alpha let's see here f prime well sorry getting off track here so O'Neill at this point says look at this alpha prime of t that velocity vector acting on f is equal to f composed with alpha um, differentiated at time t which well we have the formula up here right that is of course this is a constant so it drops out that's d dt of the integral from a to t of phi of alpha prime of u du which by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one just gives me back phi of alpha prime of t right um, but on the flip side I have alpha prime, well, by not flip side, just by putting t equal to zero, I have alpha prime of zero acting on f is equal to phi of alpha prime of zero, okay? So notice then, of course, that that gives me v acting on f is equal to phi of v, or this, of course, is nothing more than df acting on v equals to phi of v, and so there you got it, df is equal to phi, hence phi is exact. All right. All right, so I need to wrap up this lecture. What lecture are we on? I believe lecture 14. So I just have a word or two to say about manifolds. This shouldn't be too lengthy. Um, so just to summarize what, what's done in O'Neill, O'Neill in section 4.8, he describes um, what you might call an axiomatic geometric surfaces. He just takes, a, takes an abstract set. He says, okay, this abstract set is going to be our surface. Uh, what does it take for it to be a surface? It's got to be covered by patches. Um, and these patches basically need to be open. Um, of course, they need to be injective. Um, they need to smoothly overlap. Uh, we need this Hausdorff axiom because otherwise we get pesky things like <laughs> limits aren't unique. Ooh, that's that's unfortunate. See exercise 11. And then, oh, hey, by the way, we can also define velocity vectors in this abstract context. Notice here, this abstract set is not assumed to be a subset of R3. But basically we're playing the same game. We've got the same basic structure. And so... Essentially, we can recreate chapter four even for this sort of more slightly more abstract context. In particular, he points out that the surfaces embedded in R3 fit this abstract geometric surface um, framework. All right. Um, but there's even a better way of doing all of this at once, and that, that brings us to the, the honest to goodness, well, <laughs> The definition of manifold, which O'Neill gives anyway, which is, I guess, the same as the one I've seen in other places. Kind of depends. Um, an n-dimensional, usually the question is whether people want to build topology in, like tautologically, or just inherit it from some sort of uh, ambient topological structure. Uh, if you want to read a lot about the topology of manifold. Lee's book is a is a good place to read. It's got it's got a lot of a lot of things to say about topology and manifolds. Um, an n-dimensional manifold, all right, is a set M uh, furnished with a collection uh, P. 
actually this is not the definition I've seen elsewhere. Everywhere else it talks about charts. It's probably not everywhere else, we're just in my limited experience. Uh, abstract patches, sorry I forgot my abstract, which are just one-to-one -one, uh, functions x that go from d to m with d open subset of our n because we're talking about an n-dimensional manifold um, satisfying satisfying I think I'm missing a letter eh. uh, sad yeah maybe satisfying all right whatever what do they got one covering property the patches cover M. In other words, you take the union. Um, if you take the union of the images, they cover M. Two, they are smoothly overlapping. So if there's a intersection uh, between the images of the patches, then the um, corresponding you know, y inverse composed with x and x inverse composed with y are smooth whenever you have overlapping uh, overlapping patch images and <coughs> chart domains. Three, Hausdorff property. All right, so what's that? Um, if you have p not equal to Q points in M, then um, there exist disjoint uh, disjoint patches X and Y with P in well that's a it's a kind of strong condition. I wasn't expecting this. Q. I mean I would I would expect that uh I could like cut down a patch and uh cut down another patch and then Okay, I mean I, I guess the, his this his collection of patches is pretty big to be able to do this. Huh. Well, anyway, let's, I mean, I'm not gonna, we can get more, I mean, wait till we're studying manifolds properly. I'm not terribly happy about this Hausdorff property as it's currently stated. But anyway, um, essentially though, an n-dimensional manifold is, is a set that locally looks like Rn, and we can study the smoothness of functions by looking at local coordinate representatives in the same way that we've been looking at the smoothness of functions on a surface by looking at local coordinate representatives. So, you know, in short, surface is just an n equals 2 uh, dimensional manifold, all right? Or if you want to turn the tables, you could say a manifold is just an n-dimensional surface. Um, <laughs> whatever you like. Now you say, okay, well, you know, all I can see is two and three dimensions, sometimes one. So why do we need n? Well, there's lots of reasons. Um, anytime you're talking about even, you know, well, in physics, the standard example is like if you have n particles and you want to study them all at once, you can study the particles paired with their velocities. And so each particle's position is three coordinates, each particle's velocity is three coordinates. So if you have n particles, that's already six n degrees of freedom. A six n dimensional phase space just to study the motion of particles in physics. That's a pretty physical example. And um, higher dimensional manifolds come up in the study of many things. Um, I think the trap is thinking that those extra dimensions have to be spatial. They don't have to be spatial dimensions. They can be mathematical dimensions, and there's nothing wrong with that. They're still interesting.
Whether or not they're actually extra spatial dimensions, I do not know. Probably. But whatever that means. Anyway, I'm going to stop here. We have much more to say about manifolds in some other course. We're going to stick to studying surfaces in R3 for the most part. Actually, much later in this course, we'll come back and study manifolds a little bit more, but not from O'Neill. We'll study them from Wolfgang Kuhnel's book. Anyway, thanks. That ends lecture 14.